Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. I'm still not sure if this is going to be a short or a long episode. And the reason I mention this is I've said a few times before, I'm not charging any of my short episodes to Patreon. But I also found out that if you are supporting me on Patreon, and thank you for that, you can actually set up a maximum amount that you are willing to donate every month. So if in one month I produce, you know, five videos and you don't want to give more than a certain amount, you can actually set that limit, which means that I shouldn't be too much of a problem if I charge more of my episodes to Patreon, but nonetheless, I'm still not going to charge the short episodes, and depending on how long this one takes, it will fall into one or the other category. But anyway, so the purpose of this video is to repair, or attempt to repair, this Keatley 2400 source meter. And uh, the reason I chose this is not because there is documentation or schematic available, there isn't actually, but I do have a working one of these in my lab which means that if you're really stuck, we should be able to maybe use the other one as a reference. Now, the 2400 source meter from Keatley is probably the most famous and the most commonly used source meter that I think is in the industry, and it's a very famous unit, and these are still pretty expensive. A working one that's calibrated and so on, you know, you can have $2,500 uh, easily for one of these, or $2,000, and on eBay, maybe you get lucky, you get a cheaper one. Uh, but uh, this one is broken, so I, I got it for a pretty, uh, pretty next to nothing, I would say. And uh, so I'm here to see if it can be fixed. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have a simple problem like not powering on. Those are the easy things to fix. It does power on, but it has an interesting behavior. So let's plug it and see what happens and what it looks like, and then we can see if it's fixable. And one thing I forgot to mention, the Kitty 2400 is actually the old generation. I, if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you watch my Kitley 2450 and 2460 at Teardown and Reviews, where I do a whole bunch of really neat experiments with those brand new source meters, which are a huge step up from uh, this one. They're much, much faster and, of course, um, have a touchscreen GUI interface and a whole bunch of programming capabilities. They're really quite extraordinary units. Uh, they're expensive, but then again, they're also used in professional environments. But anyway, I just wanted to make say that, that to so you don't think that this is a the current version, this is not, this is a, an old generation, but nonetheless, a, an absolutely uh, long history with this one. All right, let's power this on and see what happens. Here we go. Uh, it's drawing 170 milliamps from 116 volts. I'm looking at my isolation transformer there. And uh, yeah, you can see it powers on uh, nicely. I actually missed the version because I was looking at the variable transformer, let's see it again. Revision, what? Come on. Revision C10. Uh, that is pretty old. I think revision C34 or 33 is out. So if you have to upgrade this firmware, uh, of course, right now it doesn't seem to be working. Actually, to be honest, I haven't really completely tested it. So I'm, I was told it doesn't work. But anyway, let's go and figure it out. So let's just make some settings here. Let's set the voltage to, uh, let's say, 10 volt is good. And let's set the compliance a little bit higher, just in case there is a problem at the lowest setting there. Uh, 10 milliamp. That should be good. And we're going to power it on. And let's measure the voltage. So it should show 10 volts internally, because it measures it internally also. There we go. Um, huh. Arm. Interesting. But why is it not showing anything? See, this is a strange behavior. Because normally when you enable the output, it starts measuring the voltage, and it says arm. I forget if that shows up. And this has to do with the trigger, obviously, but I, hmm, I'm not sure. Let me see. Will it put... Yeah, so this works, you know? So everything seems to be okay from the front panel, but doesn't show anything. So arm, let me see if I can trigger this manually. There we go. No, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Okay, that went away. Okay, I don't don't know what I just did, but I have to say the interface for the old Kitley 2400s. Once you start using the 2450, 2460, it kind of feels like you you know you've gone back from uh, using a tablet, let's say, to a chisel and a stone. It's just ridiculously uh, seems really outdated now. But again, this is normally it's used through the programming interface at the back. Normally people don't punch anything in here. It doesn't even have a number path, so it's not intended to be used this way. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is strange, but I can't quite remember how a working one should be here because I haven't used one in a while. Let's go check out a working one and see what it should look like. All right, here's a working one. Let's give it a try. Power on. Takes a bit to boot up again. There you go. See, this one is already C revision C32. And I hope that if there is any difference, it's not because of the firmware, but I don't think so. 
and let's go under voltage, they do exactly the same thing. We have 10 volts over there. Let's change the compliance to the same as 10 milliamp. I'm going to enable the output just like before. And oh, we we're measuring voltage. There, see, this is what I mean. Okay, it says the same thing. It does say arm, and this voltage is actually live, it's changing. Uh, how can I demonstrate this? Let's measure the current. There you go, see? Let's go and try this on the other one because this is an active display. It's constantly updating something. The same as this one. I, I see this number come up, which means something's happening in the background. And obviously, you can see that this is 600 microvolts different from what is being set. But that's probably normal. So, But yeah, I'm not sure. Interesting. But I'm also now quite a bit more worried. This is a very unusual and specific problem uh, that we're seeing. But let me go put it onto current and see if it does the same thing. I, I don't know if I just did it or not, but let me go back and try it. All right, so, yeah, you see, it, it just doesn't do the same thing. Yeah, it doesn't do the same thing. Something is up with this. Well, at this point, there's only one thing we can do. We're going to take it apart. And here's the inside of the Keatley 2400. Now, I believe that uh, a lot of you have probably seen what's inside one of these. Uh, Dave, I believe, did a teardown of this. It must have been quite a long time ago because I can't remember when I watched it, but he obviously does a very good job in those teardowns, and he's shown you all the boards and different things. But I'm just going to quickly go over it just in case you haven't seen it. Now, this is a very pristine and nice-looking board. There doesn't seem to be any leakage, any burnt components and any water leakage or anything inside of it. It's very clean. And of course, these boards have to be clean because these are you know, picoamp and picovolt or nanovolt uh, precision instruments. So any kind of residue in here will completely throw off your calibration. So you want these to be extremely clean. You should never touch this board. If you touch it, you have to clean it and recal it. So this is usually some of the things you have to be careful about. And I went over some of those techniques when I did a repair of a precision current source a long time ago. And um, a few other things to note is that if you look at this heatsink here, obviously there's a whole bunch of transistors connected to this heatsink. Now if you look at the, the service manual of this, which I may show you, the output driver portion of this instrument is quite interesting and it's a bi-CMOS design. It has both bipolars and MOSFETs in discrete, of course, and uh, they, they contribute to this instrument being a four-quadrant instrument being able to output voltage and current and so on in any of the positive or negative uh, quadrants there. And also what's interesting is that because this thing go to plus or minus 200 volt or 100 volt, this thing has plus or minus 200 volt present on the board all the time. And this is why there are cutouts here very carefully placed because high voltages are present in here. So at some point, in some place on this board between two points, you should be able to measure about 400 volts. So you have to be very, very careful with this. And uh, yeah, if you're not, you're going to zap yourself. And because this board has many different power supply planes, different digital, analog, high voltage, and so on and on, you could be probing something that's 5 volts, but it's actually, with respect to something else, it could be sitting at 100 volts. So then you touch it, and then you get you know, a pretty nasty shock. You have to be very careful. And uh, obviously, this top board here is responsible for the input and output. Uh, of the instrument itself, so this is where all the analog magic happens, as well as some digital circuitry, which we can clearly see over here. And this board is isolated from the bottom board. Uh, it's a whole bunch of row of opto isolators, which clearly separate this top board from the bottom, which is the main power supply, and most likely the main processor, and everything is down there. Hopefully, we don't have to go down there. I definitely hope not. Uh, but that's another section of the, the whole thing. If you have to take this apart, it will be pretty nasty. But anyway, you can see the isolation required uh, to electrically separate those, both for noise and uh, because of the high voltages. There's a lot of reasons for to do this. But I really like the design and how clean this is. And imagine how many thousands of engineers must have used units like this. Uh, it's pretty, pretty extraordinary. Uh, the power supply obviously comes through here. So this is going to be the main power supply region for the top board there. That looks to be either a... Let me see if I can get that off. Either a processor of some kind or an FPGA of some kind. And it says it's 2400, so, so obviously it has a firmware for the 2400 on it. Let's get rid of this and see what do we find. Jesus, this is really, really stuck. And then what do you have? Show me your secrets. I already see Altera. Altera Max, of course. Uh, that is a flash-based FPGA. So it's an FPGA and obviously the clock next to it. Uh, there it looks, these look to be either ADCs or DACs, I have to look them up, and clearly some of this digital circuitry here is being fed and controlled by this FPGA there. Interesting look, if you look very carefully, there's a very interesting ground extension all around this 
FPGA, further isolating it, really taking care of everything they can. There is a JTAG port for programming the FPGA there. Uh, now the output and inputs, the front and back of this unit have two, obviously on both sides, which means that you have to be able to switch between them. And there's a button in the front. I think I pressed it when I initially started the video. The relays to switch between an input and between the front and the back. And these go through some ferrite cores there to further remove transient noises and inductive feedback. You may have some charge coming back and they help absorb some of that. There's a lot of reasons. If you're pushing a lot of current out and all of a sudden you disconnect your load, it, it may provide you with some additional protection. This is just the LED in the front connected there. So yeah, it's pretty straightforward there. Now, <laughs> what are we going to do about the problem? Well, uh, I, I don't know what, to be honest. Um, one of the things that come to mind is, well, let's think about how this works from a system view or how it should be working. The main processor, which most likely is at the bottom, is what's driving the LCD, unless the processor of the LCD is separate. Uh, the LCD working, meaning the main processor is working. But the fact that no measurement is being done means something else that is responsible for gathering this, that measurement is not working. Because if, if let's say, some analog circuitry was broken and this thing wasn't outputting 10 volts, well, it doesn't matter. It would still measure 0 volts or measure 20 volts or measure whatever that is sitting at the ADC inputs. So it would be interesting to try and find where those ADCs are, where the voltage is read back, and find out um, where the digitization happens and see why that voltage is not showing up. That's where it is a little bit strange. Now, it is also possible that maybe the opto isolators here aren't working and the communication is just not happening. I'm just surprised that I don't see any number show up. So I'm ready to associate that more with a digital problem than with an analog problem. But again, this is just my intuition and my guess at the moment. So I say let's do some basic things. You know, you're always good to check, make sure some of the power supply voltages of this Altera, for example, are there. You know, this Altera clearly in close proximity to these ADC redacts over here are responsible for collecting data. So um, anyway, let's take a look and see if there is any activity on these. If there is activity here, that means that this is at least working. And that would be a good place to start. Well, you know, I'm desperate. So we're going to look for something. All right, let's do some power supply measurements. Now I'm going to primarily focus on some of the digital circuitry, as I said, based on my kind of intuition from the last segment there. Uh, but we are going to measure the analog power supply voltages here also. But even if these were broken, we wouldn't know because we're getting no activity of the measurements there. So we can go and measure this. Now, I got these new probes. I thought you might like to see and check them out. And uh, these are CAT3 and CAT4 rated for 1,600 volts. but if you were to turn these, you can see that the, the plastic sheet peels back and the rating becomes CAT2, which is kind of funny. Anyway, so we're going to use these. And uh, the reason I'm going to use these is because well, they're new and we're going to look at some high voltages here. Now, if I turn this on, uh, actually, I actually have to turn my isolation transformer on. There we go. So it's powered down just to show you that this thing is actually quite dangerous just the body of this transformer here, the, the chassis is safe of course, but the body of the transformer here with respect to the top of the capacitor here, you can see that we have minus 255 volts. So uh, even if you're putting your hand around it when it's on, it, it can be quite dangerous, so you have to be very careful. So I'm going to try and probe some of the digital voltages around there and see if we get correct digital voltage. Now I thought, that, you know, maybe pick some simple uh, circuitry over here and see if I can find a plus or minus 5 volt and uh, go from there. So I spent about 10 minutes probing around, and I can't really find anything uh, problematic. You just have to be careful about how you probe it, as I mentioned uh, just now. For example, here's a common test point. This is labeled uh, common, and if I put my, I'm sitting at a very bad angle here, if I put my multimeter probe on it, and if I look at some of the other voltages, to, for example, the metal chassis of the crystal, and there we see <laughs> minus 235 volts. <laughs> so you have to be very careful. These voltages are all really are quite uh, all over the place. and um, But I do find one point which is easy to measure. Uh, decoupling caps across various digital circuits are a good place to start. So there's a decoupling cap right there. I'm going to connect it backwards here, but that's okay. And that decoupling cap, if I measure, you can see I see minus uh, 5 volts there. So there is definitely power supply present on our FPGA portion. And I measured the IO power supply voltages on this uh, Max uh, Altera 
FPGA as well, and they are 3.3 volts and so on. So it does actually make sense, and it does have the correct uh, power supply voltages. Now there is a couple of clock and data lines marked here, which I assume are monitoring the data going in and out between this digital part of the board there and the main processor board, which is uh, underneath. So we can go ahead and take an oscilloscope and try and measure some of those and see if we see any activity on those. All right, let's go ahead and do some measurement here. Now, by the way, if I sound like I am whispering, it's because I bought a new wireless microphone specifically for my Sony camera. But the Sony camera itself is great, I have no complaint. But this wireless microphone module, this one, that I, that I also bought uh, that connects to the hot shoe of the camera, and this is connected to a headset around my head, it comes in so loud, I have to whisper, and there's no volume control on this. You cannot do automatic gain control on this microphone, which is just absurd. I, I cannot imagine why Sony hasn't implemented this. Or, and if it has, I cannot find it. Anyway, I apologize for that. And if you know a better solution, please let me know. So here we go. Now we can go and measure some activity on this FPGA just to make sure things are coming in, in and out. Now, I went in and looked at some of these lines. So let me show you what I'm, what I'm observing there. So, Let's go here on to our scope there. So I'm using the MDO from Tektronix. I did a full review of this one, and I recommend that you watch this. It's a pretty amazing instrument. So let's go and see if we see any activity on these opto isolators. So I'm just monitoring the opto isolator outputs. If I, no matter where I test here, I either see just high or just low. So it doesn't seem like anything is coming in and out, and I just, for the life of me, can't figure out why. So then I thought, well, let's look at the clock uh, of the main FPGA, because that's obviously a very important signal. If there's no clock, there's going to be no activity from the FPGA. Now, before that, the FPGA also has um, several other inputs. Uh, it has an OE input, which is like a master output enable. It has a master clock, global clock, and so on. Now, I found the OE2, and if I monitor that, you can see this signal here. Now, this is on a very slow time base. This is two, 20 milliseconds per division. So that signal is just under 20 milliseconds. And it just happens to come and go at a very steady, slow pace. So this is not a high-speed communication line. It almost seems like it's polling the FPGA. It's kind of telling it, OK, I'm ready, I'm ready. Do something, do something. And it doesn't seem like it's doing anything. So then I said, well, let's look at the main global clock. And the global clock is three pins over. So if I go to the global clock and I put it down, and there doesn't seem to be a global clock, which is really strange. I mean, crystals don't usually fail. So, but the problem is that if you look here, unfortunately, this, this crystal, its output is on the other side of the board, and I can't access it, and there's no way for me to see it. So maybe I have no choice but to just take this board out and find a way so we can look at this, uh, because the trace seems to go inside the board, and I don't... I don't think I can see it coming out. But anyway, let me start taking this apart and, and see if we can figure out why there is no clock. OK, you're going to like this one. So I was about to take this apart. I actually started taking some of the screws off and everything. And then I found something as I was uh, looking around. And you're going to laugh at this, but check this out. Oh, get the focus of this to work. Do you see any problems, uh, for example, some kind of uh, IC not sitting on the board? I have no idea what's going on here. It's interesting because it looks like this is not completely sitting down on the board, right? And these pins don't seem to be making contact. Now, there seems to be some... I actually started kind of probing a little bit here. That's why this looks a little different. But anyway, I, you can see I, I can just then these pins it looks like. So they're definitely not sitting in the right places. It looks like this was not completely properly soldered or someone tried to replace it. I'm not sure. But there's also some sign here uh, that if you look carefully, it looks like some somebody's been someone's touched this up. Like this could be from the factory because there is some other little tiny fixes on the board also, but that simply could be uh, this is how it was shipped. But this looks like it was an intermittent contact, perhaps, and eventually came off thermally over time. I'm not sure, but uh, I looked this up. This is a quad D flip-flop, and its proximity to this 12 megahertz Fox crystal certainly suggests that there's part of some kind of clock distribution network, maybe. So 
yeah, this seems to be an issue. So let's go ahead and, and take a closer look and maybe we can fix the soldering and then probe it and see if we see any signal on it. Uh, that should be pretty interesting. All right, now the goal is to try and see if we can get this thing to set back down uh, just by reflowing it a little bit with um, a hot air. So let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna heat this up. Let's see if it will uh, sit back down actually. Do this a little bit. Let's see now what do we have here. We might take some time. Well, it looks like it it may have done it. Yep, there's a lot of smoke that came out of that. So uh yeah, let's see what happened. I have to examine it a bit closer, but I think it did sit back down. Alright, let's give this guy another try. So um, I'm going to do exactly the same thing as I was doing before. So I'm going to go to uh, measuring voltage. Let's set this guy to 10 volts or something. And ah, there we go. Look at that. So now we're measuring it again. So yeah, there's activity now. So this was, um, I guess, a, a good initial intuition what was wrong. But of course, you know, finding an, a physical representation of what's wrong is always a good thing. And if that IC wasn't off the board and it was simply dead, or another IC on the clock path was dead, we could have traced that hopefully and found it. But it looks like that uh, that it indeed it is back to life. So I, this thing should be able to go very high in voltage, up to 200 volts or so. So there you go, 100 volts, 209. That's the absolute maximum it can do. And it should be able to also go negative there is negative 209 volts. Now it doesn't seem to be very well calibrated uh, based on what I'm looking at here so uh, let's go ahead and set it back to let's say something a little bit more reasonable. Let's say minus 10 I can see it's uh, not not very good but I would suggest let's do the following. Let's hook it up to you know let's just calibrate it. It's not going to be the greatest calibration in the world but I'm going to let it stay on for about 20 or 30 minutes. I've also got my Keatley DMM7510, which is a seven and a half digit meter. It should be good enough to calibrate it. And let's see what the calibration procedure is. Since we the repair didn't take as much time as I thought, we may as well go ahead with the calibration. All right, I've gone ahead and upgraded the firmware and I did most of the calibration. This is just the last step. We can see how the calibration procedure is done. Right now I'm calibrating the current on the one amp range and the instrument is supposed to be providing one amp. But as you can see here, it's just a little bit under one amp. So what we do is we go ahead in here and we set this to match what we were reading over there. So again, this is a not the greatest calibration in the world, but uh, it's going to be pretty good. So we have three nines here. And we have a 5 and a 7. That should be good enough for our purposes. And uh, now it's going to display 0. So when it displays 0, it's not going to be doing exactly 0. So we're going to go through this procedure and just finish it off. It's nothing really fancy. Just wanted to show you that I'm indeed doing the full calibration. And there you have it, a nice and easy quick repair. I think I enjoyed this one quite a bit, even though we were uh, lucky to find the problem relatively quickly as opposed to having to dig through and find it. But I think the intuition was in a good place, so we, there was a good chance that we would find it. Now I'm going to start giving some equipment away that I repair in the future. I have a few things here lined up, so if you're on Patreon, uh, I would be giving it away to my Patreon supporters. I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to do that. Uh, I was going to give it to, for example, the person who supports me the most on Patreon, but then it occurred to me that a person who provides a lot of support may simply be better off financially. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer it to the person who's supporting me the most, and then if they choose to pass it on to the next person, then they can pass it on to the next person. So I'll show you the equipment I'm giving away on the next repair video. In the meanwhile, I'm going to do another question and answer session. So post your questions here on the YouTube comment section as well as on Twitter and I will make another episode and hopefully it will be fun and I'll pick up you know 10-20 questions or whatever it may be and make a nice 40-45 uh, minute episode from it. So I'll see you next time.